we have to look at a chart of, you know, bank lending versus interest rates. Would it support the idea that when you cut interest rates, bank lending increases? Or would it, you know, suggest maybe the opposite? And again, the period with the lowest credit, like the lowest rates of credit growth was the 2010s and interest rates were at zero the whole time. And the period with the highest credit growth was actually the 1970s and interest rates were at, you know, 10, 15, 20. If you look at what's called the effective mortgage rate, meaning what are people who have mortgages actually paying, it bottomed at, you know, 2% in 2021. And now it's at like three and a half percent. It's It's been a very slow, gradual rise. So the Fed's attempt at shocking the system and raising interest rates from zero to five hasn't been much of a shock. And on top of that, a lot of that shock was was born or was bared out by the government and not the private sector. And the government can issue the currency to pay for its its interest, interest service, service. And that's not affecting the private so sector. If we look through history, you know, when was the period of the highest nominal GDP growth? It was the 1970s. And the 1970s also had the highest interest rates of any sort of decade uh, in the last, you know, however many hundred hundred years. And then on the, on the other side, um, you know, the, the 10 years that had the lowest interest rates was the 2010s. And just as, as the Fisher sort of equation would expect, the decade with the lowest nominal GDP growth was the 2010s. So the answer to that would be in recession, interest rates would fall because what do interest rates represent? The risk-free rate. That's the rate on a safe government bond. And in a recession, the demand for a safe government bond would already be rising because people want that particular kind of asset. And in that world, interest rates would already be falling. So that sort of begs the question of, you know, is the Fed really doing anything stimulative to uh, the economy by cutting rates that the market would already be cutting? right here one or a few on there man did you see me though cause the short put on the show i'm dancing on the tables and i must say i got a taste for a flip and i'm glancing at the haters and i know they wish they did a shit And if you look at what's called the effective mortgage rate, meaning what are people who have mortgages actually paying, it bottomed at you know two percent in 2021, and now it's at like three and a half percent. It's it's been a very slow, gradual rise. So the Fed's attempt at shocking the system and raising interest rates from zero to five hasn't been much of a shock. And on top of that, a lot of that shock was was born or was bared out by the government and not the private sector. And the government can issue the currency to pay for its its interest interest service service, and that's not affecting the private sector either. Yeah, it's you know the Fed is in a tough spot, right? So not only do they not exist <laughs> per per your thesis, but you know they're trying to implement tight monetary policy, i.e., through rates. Yep. That's having lower effect than expected yep. and they're trying also to restrict via their balance sheet in yep. qt that is not having an effect either because through the back door they are doing the opposite right yep. plus you have the the treasury dominating yep. uh and saying you know what fed that's pretty cute what you're trying to do here's my stimulus so this, this is what uh, fiscal dominance is this is just a classic case of that yeah, exactly. And I, I believe you said we, we hadn't had a scenario or, or, or an environment similar to this. What about the 40s, though? Was the that 40s. not a, a right? Um, the 40s is 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 the only um, case that I think really applies. And it's it's a great example, which is uh, the government spent a ton of money through the basically to finance the war. The government spent all that money. 
the, the economy was sort of locked down for the war period. And then suddenly, you know, the, the Fed, sorry, the, the, the private sector um, came back, had a lot of money to spend that produced these waves of inflation. So through the 40s, interest rates were actually kind of at zero. And so if you look at the inflation rate from this time, inflation actually was always transitory through the entire 40s, which is kind of interesting. It's not like the 1970s where inflation, you know, picked up and was, was sustaining. It's actually only when the Fed started to raise interest rates in the 50s and 60s that we got that combination of the government dumped a ton of money on the private sector. And now interest rates are starting to rise. So the, the private sector feels encouraged to do all sorts of economic activity. I think there's an argument that that's how we got into the 70s of, you know, just very high inflation and very high interest rates. Yeah, I've always said that, you know, inflation and disinflation are a pendulum. It constantly swings from structural disinflation to inflation Definitely. and back to disinflation. Um, I've always thought of, of you know cycles like that. Yep. Wait, here's here's one question though. So rates currently are high, yep. you know, higher than they've been in you know the past uh, you know, twenty years. Uh, but why isn't back lending picking up though? Yep. What if you see the chart of bank creation? You see a downward trend. It's picking yep. up a little bit recently, but it's been on a downward trend, and therefore. In my view, that's one of the reasons why the Treasury has needed to step up with its money creation, right? But so why does not bank lending not pick up despite these higher rates? Yeah, so that's another great question. So like you said, interest rates are, you know, raised, went up from 0% in 2022 to 5% now. Bank lending, the rate of bank lending growth is now basically flat um, on a year over year basis. So the question is, you know, what, why shouldn't, shouldn't bank lending be, be high? And so I think it's a few things. I think the, the there's two things that come to mind. So the first thing is, like I said, the the private sector deleveraged and was dumped with this this influx of of cash from the government. And that environment, the demand for borrowing will actually tend to be relatively low because there's not you know much activity that needs to be financed when there is the equity available on the private sector's balance sheets to finance it. So there's not much more borrowing that needs to happen. And this is what you tend to see, which is in, in these periods, which is after the recession, the government spending increases because of unemployment and these benefits and the, the private sector's you know, willingness to borrow falls because they are receiving more, more payments. So like I said, somebody is doing the borrowing. It's just not banks right now. It's, it's the government that's doing the borrowing, um, but somebody is. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, and this is a little bit more like you might say like conspiratorial, but it's that the bank simply took the Fed at its word that we're going to cause the Fed is going to cause a recession. So as a bank, why, why the heck would I lend? You know, uh, if we look at the, the senior loan officer survey, the, like it's called the SLUs, what we saw is that when the Fed started raising rates, banks started tightening their lending standards at an extremely rapid rate at a rate. So then the question is, OK, is it the empirics are right? Or is it some sort of long and variable lags where the Fed raised rates in 2004 to 2006, and that's why in 2009 lending was low? So, and that's the, that's the the idea that the Fed sort of relies upon, which is there's a long and variable lag between what the Fed is doing and what's happening in the economy. Where you know, if the Fed is raising rates today to cool the economy and cool bank lending, the idea is in you know a few years two or three years into the future that's when the economy will start to start to cool down so the main pushback that i have to this idea that low rates stimulate bank lending and high rates cool down bank lending is on the issue of what does it mean for the fed to raise that interest rate and what does that interest rate actually represent and that interest rate is the interest rate on a safe government asset it's on a risk-free asset and i think this is very important because when you're raising the rate or the interest rate on a safe asset, it actually has the opposite effect on a risky asset. And uh, the way I kind of describe this in, in one of my presentations called the Fed does not exist is that when you create a safe asset shortage and the Fed does this by cutting interest rates, because when you cut interest rates, you essentially raise the price of all, of all uh, safe assets. When you create a safe asset shortage, you actually reduce the ability to take on risk. So if you think about, you know, a safe government bond as sort of like insurance, um, and let's use the example of like home insurance, for example, 
you know, the question is like, which environment would be better to buy a home in? An environment where home insurance, home insurance is very expensive or an environment where home insurance is very cheap? And the obvious answer is, you know, it's only when home insurance is pretty cheap. That's that's a better environment for you to buy a home in because every you know rational person is going to buy the home and the home insurance together. And so the cheaper that the home insurance is, the more attractive that the home looks. And so similarly, you can think about treasuries, government securities as the insurance for the economy. And if that insurance, those treasuries are too expensive, then it's difficult to actually take on risk. If you're a bank and your portfolio of treasuries is yielding you zero income, then how much risk can you really take on with your risky side of your portfolio? Whereas, you know, if the risk-free rate is at like 5%, let's say, and now your risk-free basket of treasuries is, is yielding a lot, that's actually an environment where it's easier to take risk. And I think that explains sort of what we see through history with bank lending. Yeah, so let, let me try to let me try to deep dive there. Yeah. I guess it makes a lot of sense what you're saying in terms of bank lending, decreasing when rates are low. And we can point to the US, we can point to Japan. Because um, right. from a bank's perspective, one of the key ingredients for deciding to hand out a loan is the credit worthiness of the borrower, right? Yeah. So if you're in an environment where rates are zero, that's not a very positive risk on environment. No. Therefore, banks obviously are going to be reluctant to lend. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. What I have hard, a hard time um, swallowing, uh, Ritik, is when, when yields are close to zero, and, and this leads me to a topic that I wanted to discuss with you further down the line, but uh, let's do it now. When yields are low, i.e., what people think QE does, does that not logically incentivize investors to go down the credit curve to try to pinch a little bit of extra, um, you know, yield yep. on riskier assets? What, what you're saying is the exact opposite, correct? Yep, correct. Yes. So that's a great point. So um, this is one of the sort of classic channels of how you know qe is supposed to stimulate the economy how even lowering interest rates is supposed to stimulate the economy which is if you make safe assets government bonds unattractive by lowering their yield then that should push investors into a little bit riskier assets because they want to you know they're yield maximizing so they want to try to generate as much yield as possible so we can think about you know i like to think about like a spectrum or a risk curve of all these assets starting with safe assets as you know the lowest yielding most risk free least risky assets on the on one side and slowly moving up so we have you know you can say like then mortgage backed securities and then like corporate credit and then eventually even like stocks and crypto and those kinds of things so the the way that i, I see this is what happens when we are in an, in an environment that is short of insurance, meaning that interest rates are very low and now there aren't uh, very attractive safe opportunities. You would think, and it makes you know logical sense that, okay, you know, if, if, if safety is unavailable, then let's, you know, just take risk because why, why put money into these like zero yielding? So then the question is, okay, is it the empirics are right or is it some sort of long and variable lags where the Fed raised rates in 2004 to 2006 and that's why in 2009 lending was low. So, and that's the, that's the the idea that the Fed sort of relies upon, which is there's a long and variable lag between what the Fed is doing and what's happening in the economy. Where you know, if the Fed is raising rates today to cool the economy and cool bank lending, the idea is in you know a few years, two or three years into the future, that's when the economy will start start to cool down. So the main pushback that I have to this idea that low rates stimulate bank lending and high rates cool down bank lending is on the issue of what does it mean for the Fed to raise that interest rate and what does that interest rate actually represent? And that interest rate is the interest rate on a safe government asset. It's on a risk-free asset. And I think this is very important because when you're raising the rate or the interest rate on a safe asset, it actually has the opposite effect on a risky asset. And uh, the way I kind of describe this in, in one of my presentations called The Fed Does Not Exist is that when you create a safe asset shortage, and the Fed does this by cutting interest rates, because when you cut interest rates, you essentially raise the price of all, of all uh, safe assets. 
when you create a safe asset shortage, you actually reduce the ability to take on risk. So if you think about, you know, a safe government bond as sort of like insurance, um, and let's use the example of like home insurance, for example, you know, the question is like, which environment would be better to buy a home in? An environment where home insurance, home insurance is very expensive or an environment where home insurance is very cheap. And the obvious answer is, you know, it's only when home insurance is pretty cheap, that's, that's a better environment for you to buy a home in because every, you know, rational person is going to buy the home and the home insurance together. And so the cheaper that the home insurance is, the more attractive that the home looks. And so similarly, you can think about treasuries, government securities as the insurance for the economy. And if that insurance, those treasuries are too expensive, then it's difficult to actually take on risk. If you're a bank and your portfolio of treasuries is yielding you zero income, then how much risk can you really take on with your risky side of your portfolio? Whereas, you know, if the risk free rate is at like 5%, let's say, and now your risk free basket of treasuries is, is yielding a lot, that's actually an environment where it's easier to take risk. And I think that explains sort of what we see through history with bank lending. Yeah, so let, let me try to let me try to deep dive there. Yeah. I guess it makes a lot of sense what you're saying in terms of bank lending, decreasing when rates are low. And we can point to the US, we can point to Japan. Because um, right. from a bank's perspective, one of the key ingredients for deciding to hand out a loan is the credit worthiness of the borrower, right? Yeah. So if you're in an environment where rates are zero, that's not a very positive risk on environment. No. Therefore, banks obviously are going to be reluctant to lend. That makes a lot of sense. What I have hard, a hard time um, swallowing, uh, Ritik, is when, when yields are close to zero, and, and this leads me to a topic that I wanted to discuss with you further down the line, but uh, let's do it now. When yields are low, i.e., what people think QE does, does that not logically incentivize investors to go down the credit curve to try to pinch a little bit of extra, um, you know, yield yep. on riskier assets? What, what you're saying is the exact opposite, correct? Yep, correct. Yes. So that's a great point. So um, this is one of the sort of classic channels of how you know qe is supposed to simulate the economy how even lowering interest rates is supposed to simulate the economy which is if you make safe assets government bonds unattractive by lowering their yield then that should push investors into a little bit riskier assets because they want to you know they're yield maximizing so they want to try to generate as much yield as possible so we can think about you know i like to think about like a spectrum or a risk curve of all these assets starting with safe assets as you know the lowest yielding most risk free least risky assets on the on one side and slowly moving up so we have you know you can say like then mortgage backed securities and then like corporate credit and then eventually even like stocks and crypto and those kinds of things so the the way that i, I see this is what happens when we are in an, in an environment that is short of insurance, meaning that interest rates are very low and now there aren't uh, very attractive safe opportunities. You would think, and it makes you know logical sense that, okay, you know, if, if, if safety is unavailable, then let's, you know, just take risk because why, why put money into these like zero yielding Put on the show. I'm dancing on the tables, and I must say I got a taste for living out. I'm glancing at the 